President-elect Stone, Provost McCarthy, members of the platform party, graduands and guests, uh, I uh, accept this honor with uh, uh, great humility and uh, great gratitude. It's a remarkable thing uh, to be honored by your university, your peers, um, and all those who supported my application uh, or my nomination for this award. Um, I know some of you are probably thinking, I thought I was done with that guy. I'm assuming some of you probably had my first year course at some point in the last couple of years. But don't be discouraged. This will not take long. It will be as brief as many Hollywood careers. <laughs> um, it is a great honor for me to accept this. And uh, I saw something on the news the other day that uh, kind of rang true with me. And just stick with me for a minute. I was watching CNN and they were interviewing Mike Huckabee, who many of you will know, former governor of Arkansas, currently running for the Republican nomination uh, for president. And uh, he was asked about his previous success in Iowa campaigning. And he had this really funny line, I thought. He said, you know, if you ever see a turtle on top of a fence post, the one thing you know is that he didn't get there by himself. That rang true to me. That was funny, by the way. Um, <laughs> that, that rang true for me because I didn't get here by myself. None of you got here by yourself. And uh, it's important to acknowledge our gratitude. Uh, in my case, uh, to my parents, um, my late father and mother. My mother's actually right there, funny enough. And uh, all of the support they gave me to get through graduate school, you know how hard it is uh, to get a degree. And uh, I had this support and it helped me very much, so thank you, Mom. Um, I also wanna thank my colleagues and my professors. Uh, I was a Brock student. I graduated from Brock in 1990, almost to the day, 25 years ago, June 4th, 1990. And, uh, uh, my teaching is a reflection of the teaching I received, of the, the, the models that I had, the, the mentors, uh, the very great teachers that we have here at Brock. And, and all of you know now at the opposite end of the, your degree process, you know how valuable teaching is at Brock, how, uh, in what esteem it's held and what great teachers we have. So in that context, it's an enormous honor for me to accept this. Uh, I should say too, um, I also want to thank all of the great TAs I've had. Teaching assistants do a lot of the work at the university, uh, as many of you will know, and uh, uh, I could not look good without uh, their great work. All right, so let me get to my convocation address. Um, for me, as I mentioned, it seems like yesterday, 25 years ago at Brock, like you now, waiting for someone I never heard of to stop talking. Unlike today though, 1990 was a little bit different, I think. It was a little more optimistic. The Cold War was wrapping up. There was this naive idea uh, held by many that all the money spent on nuclear weapons might now be channeled towards curing disease, alleviating poverty, this kind of thing. But it didn't go quite that way. And I think we now live intense times. There's fear everywhere. Fear of terrorism, fear of epidemics, fear of renewed superpower rivalries around the world. There is even, and I hate to say it, I just read this the other day, fear of a second entourage movie. <laughs> In these troubled times, what can I possibly offer to you as a potential remedy to cure the ills of our day? Well, I have a suggestion. I think we need to embrace our inner Spock. Yes, I said Spock. On February 27th of this year, the world witnessed the passing of Leonard Nimoy. By all accounts, a wonderful man. He left us with this incredible legacy, this 
pop culture icon of Spock, the half-human, half-Vulcan science officer on the Star Trek Enterprise. Almost everyone, I think, in the world would recognize the character of Spock. Spock, the logical foil to his impulsive and emotional captain, played by the awesome William Shatner, on Star Trek, a show that I cannot believe will celebrate its 50th anniversary next year. Wow, I feel old. Despite its brief time on NBC for three years, it has become a major global phenomena with all of the Star Trek movies, uh, references to Spock uh, in TV shows like The Big Bang Theory. Spock is a symbol now, a symbol of discipline, of virtue, of rationality. I happened to read this yesterday, the International Astronomical Union, a couple of days ago, named an asteroid 4864 Nimoy, after Leonard Nimoy. It is orbiting the sun between Mars and Jupiter. He's even on our $5 bill. Spock has many virtues. He's a Star Trek science officer, or Starfleet, I should say. That's not easy. Hard to get into Starfleet, some of you will know. He's a person of intellect. He is intensely loyal to his captain and crew. You may recall him in the first season of Star Trek, kidnapping his former captain, Pike, and transporting him to Talos IV. I believe that was the name of the planet. Where, he, And for doing so, he would face almost certain, an almost certain death sentence. That's the kind of loyalty that Spock had. He's spiritual. Sometimes you can see him meditating in his quarters. He's humble too, like me, probably one of the more humble people around. There you go. Of course, Spock wasn't always serious and intellectual. He could kick butt when necessary. And as you may recall, once jammed with a group of space hippies in the lounge of the Enterprise. But for me, of all of his virtues, the one we need more of in these times is his dedication to reason. Reason is both a verb and a noun. It refers to a kind of evidence-based thought process that informs our arguments and worldviews. And of course, this should be intuitively familiar to all of you who have spent the last four years writing papers with theses, assembling evidence, making arguments, and drawing appropriate conclusions. Reason, though, is not just a private mental exercise that we do academically. It is also part of a process of public deliberation. As Michael Lynch argues in his book, In Praise of Reason, it must also be a public and transparent way of showing our work. If you recall this from elementary school, it wasn't enough to give the right answer. You had to actually show how you got the correct math answer. Public reason is like that. We, we can't simply assert a policy preference. We need to explain it and show how we came to that conclusion. From ancient Greece to the Enlightenment, philosophers have championed reason. It is through reason that we reach the very best decisions and advance our collective welfare. Reason demands that we engage in dialogue, not monologue, and not try to stifle debate or silence alternative views. We live in an unreasonable world. Carl Sagan referred to this in his 1996 book as the demon-haunted world. That book, by the way, is free. Any of you could go read it today. Um, it's a free ebook, and I highly recommend it. A world where knowledge and reason have to compete with superstition, conspiracy, and prejudice. Look around. Anti-vaccine crusaders terrify parents who refuse to vaccinate children for fear of autism. This despite the fact that there is no evidence to support a causal link between the MMR vaccine and autism. The consequences of this are very serious. Outbreaks of measles in the last year or two are a consequence of intelligent people rejecting reason and refusing to vaccinate their children. This despite the fact, and it's available for anyone, 
to see that the only study linking vaccines to autism was fully retracted by the journal Lancet in 2010 because of a variety of fundamental flaws in the research. We live in a world where religious demagogues lure young people to fight in Syria and Iraq, where politicians in the highest offices deny climate change and the enormous body of science that forecasts serious consequences for our planet, where our government here in Canada stifles and silences scientists, where the internet has become an incubator of conspiracy theory, where racism continues to rear its ugly head in the form of police shootings, flotillas of Rohingya refugees fleeing oppression in Myanmar, and the resurgence of anti-Semitism in Europe. Irrational beliefs, ones without supporting evidence or coherent arguments, are dooming animals like the rhinoceros to extinction. There are lucrative markets for the horns of these animals, even though there is no evidence for their medical efficacy. Last year in South Africa, 1,215 rhinos were slain to provide horns for this market. Today there are five, five northern white rhinos on this planet. Four of them are female. Three of them are in Kenya, two are in zoos. The outlook for that species is not very good. We are, in my view, tossing Mona Lisa's on a bonfire when we allow millions of years of evolution to come to such an abrupt and senseless end. I could go on all day. Luckily for you, I was given about eight minutes. The problems I describe here share a single common property. They are a consequence of irrational thought. Racism is irrational because trivial phenotypical differences between people are irrelevant for determining the worth and character of any person. Science tells us genetically we are a remarkably uniform species. Despite our various physical superficial differences, we are remarkably similar to each other. Racism is therefore irrational or illogical, as Spock might say. And I think we can make similar arguments about the bigotry that we see in the world against religious minorities um, and the irrational hatred we see in some places directed at gays, lesbians, and transgendered people. Now, we're all human, so it's a, it's a bit of a big request to ask you to always be rational in every aspect of your life. But remember, Spock was partly human too. Uh, so it's an aspiration, it's a goal to try to achieve, even if we do not always uh, find ourselves up to the task. If you've ever found yourself up late at night watching an infomercial on TV, elbow deep in a bag of Oreos, you know sometimes we don't quite get there. So I challenge you. When considering the important questions of our time, ask yourself, what would Spock do? Would Spock advocate or tolerate racism? Would Spock ignore scientific evidence for political expediency? You already know the answer. Each of us has a responsibility in a liberal democracy to reason carefully about the issues of the day. Don't be conned by politicians, ideologues, demagogues, and internet charlatans. Embrace your inner Spock. Individually and collectively, we need this now more than ever. So in closing, I'll leave you with the obvious salutation that's appropriate here from Spock himself. Live long and prosper.